always made up half of the Earth's population. But despite this simple fact, for most of human history, women were forced to take a back seat while a small inner circle of men ruled over the rest. Advocating for legal, political and moral equality between men and women is today known as feminism. Typically, feminism is thought as a modern idea that originated amongst the 20th century suffragettes and was further developed by subsequent generations of people inspired by their actions. The reality is a bit more complicated. Throughout history, women in different times, places and cultures have argued for women's right to equal treatment, liberty and education. In this episode, we will be covering the life and works of Arcangela Tarabati, an Italian woman of the 17th century who was forced into a nunnery at the young age of 16 by her father to help ensure the economic stability of her family. At the age of 16, she stepped foot in the place she would live and die. Tarabati never saw the outside of the convent walls again. Condemned to an isolated existence, Tarabati took advantage of the tools at her disposal, learning to read and write in Latin. Though outwardly she conformed to her covenant rules, Tarabadi had decided to dedicate her life to exposing the unfairness, cruelty, and hypocrisy of men's oppression of women. Thanks to her peculiar circumstances, Tarabadi has become a unique critic of the state, the church, and the patriarchy. For most of recorded human history, women have been woefully oppressed. But by Archangel Tarabadi's day, the status quo of misogyny was being questioned. Women's oppression was buttressed upon two traditions, the ancient world and selective quotations from the Bible. Greek philosophers like Aristotle associated the male sex with virtues like judgment, courage, and strength, while the female sex was indicative of vices like irrationality, cowardice, and weakness. Aristotle even went as far as to call women defective or mutilated males. Greek medicine pioneered by Galen grounded misogynist attitudes in science. Greek theorists believed the womb was the woman's dominant organ, and it was the cause of woman's nature as a deceitful, talkative, irrational, and hysterical being. Today. The Greek word for womb, hysteria, is the root of the word hysterical. Roman society held a similar distrust towards women. Patriarchy was the unquestionable system of the Romans, with the head of the family being referred to as the paterfamilias, meaning the father of the family. A paterfamilias wielded what was called patria podestas, paternal power. Pater translated to father in the sense of a head of a household. This means he not only owned the household's property, but also its human members. In rare circumstances, the paterfamilias had the power to even kill his wife or children, though this was rarely used. Roman marriage placed women under the authority of male figure. Husbands could divorce their partners in charges of adultery, or even small transgressions like drinking wine without permission. Women did not inherit their husband's fortune. Instead, he went to his male heirs, cleanly jumping over the grieved widow. The ancient world provided intellectual ammunition and institutions required to prop up a male-dominated world. Secondly, we have selective quotes from the Bible. Misogynists scoured the Bible to support the oppression of women. To support their claims, misogynists relied primarily on two sections. The story of creation in Genesis and the epistles defining women's role in the church, St. Paul. In Genesis, God created man in his own image. Then after that, God created Eve from the rib of Adam. From this, theologians extrapolated that Adam was created first, therefore it is symbolic of woman's subordination to man, somehow. Genesis also contains the story of humanity's fall from grace. Because Eve picked the fruit from the forbidden tree due to the serpent's temptations, Eve was blamed for the misery unleashed upon all of the human species. Women are thus to blame for all the problems in the world because of Eve. The epistles of St. Paul offer advice to early Christians seeking to establish religious communities. Paul offered both favourable and quite unfavourable assessments of women. For example, in Galatians, Paul captures egalitarian sentiments, writing, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, Paul would also promote a more hierarchical view of the world, writing in Corinthians, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Unlike ancient authors' opinions, the Bible had much to offer later writers for arguments in favour of egalitarian views. After all, in the Bible, women slay tyrants, are present for the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and of course, Mary the Virgin carries Jesus. The 14th century writer Christine de Pizan, who was my first ever podcast episode, was one of the first authors to question this tradition of misogyny in her work entitled The Book of the City of Ladies. 
Christine argues against the usual portrait of women painted as shallow, weak, and irrational beings by retelling stories from mythology, history, the Bible, and even contemporary events to show that women are, in fact, capable of everything men can do. Whether it's commanding armies, writing literature, or becoming a martyr, women can do everything men can. You just have to look. Christine became one of the first ever women to earn her living through writing, and she inspired many women to question the status quo of their place in society and follow her footsteps. But despite Christine de Pizan's writings, women's situation did not improve dramatically. They were still legally, intellectually, and physically deemed subordinate to men. This was the cruel world that Archangela Tarabadi was born into on February 24, 1604. Her actual birth name was Elena Cassandra Tarabati. She was born in Venice to Stefano Tarabati and Maria Cadena. Elena was one of eleven children and was the eldest of seven daughters. But something about her separated from the rest. Unlike her siblings, Elena had inherited her father's physical disabilities. Her father deemed her unmarriageable due to the same limp that had not personally stopped him from having eleven children himself. The limp may have helped up make his mind, but the limp was not solely why Elena Tarabati was doomed. Something much larger was at play. By the 17th century, Venice had miraculously held its status as an independent city, garnering a reputation for liberty, virtue, and republican values. However, the harmony of Venice was built on shaky foundations. The patrician families who dominated politics had a big problem. Marriages. Any marriage required a dowry, regardless of class or wealth. The dowry was the economic foundation upon which a new marriage was to be based on. But for the noble patrician families, this was a huge problem. To maintain their power, they had to pay colossal dowries. But for families like Tarabadis, that means seven hefty dowries for each daughter. A recipe for financial ruin for the family, a slow decline into obscurity. You might ask, why could women just not marry? This was a huge no-no. If a family's daughter did not get married, their chastity was questioned. With chastity being deemed the primary value of woman, families did not want their names being dragged through the mud or their authority questioned. To avoid both financial ruin and tarnishing the family name, a nice alternative reared its head. The only place where a woman could avoid marriage while also preventing attacks on her chastity was by joining a nun's convent. Patrician families, afraid of losing their fortunes, forced their daughters to join religious orders against their will, a practice that became known as monarchization. This practice of monarchization, forcing young girls in religious orders, was surprisingly common not only in Venice but across Europe. In Venice alone, there were 2,500 nuns spread across 35 convents. But when one includes the Venetian convents on islands, this brings the total number of convents to at least 52. By the 17th century, three-fifths of patrician women in Venice were housed in convents. Tarabadi would later explain, the fathers do not offer up their most beautiful and virtuous daughter to the nuns. No, no, no. Instead, they send off those who are lame or have some sort of disability or deformity. Fathers then blame their unfortunate daughters for whatever ailments they possess and condemn them to a life in the convent. When Elena Tarabadi was only 14 years old, her father forced her to take her first vows at the Benedictine convent of Santa Anna. By the age of 16, she took her four vows of poverty, chastity, obedience and stability. She was never to own any property, have a husband or any form of relationship, and to obey her superiors. The last vow of stability is incredibly depressing. Elena was expected never to leave the convent ever again, and she would even be buried on the convent grounds as a symbol of her devotion. Upon taking her vows, Elena Tarabadi became Archangela Tarabadi. Though Archangela translates to high-ranking angel, Tarabadi had no intentions of conforming to the convent rules. In her early days, her most egregious rebellion was her refusal to wear the habit properly and to cut her hair. This culminated in a cardinal coming in and scolding her, and convincing her that she has to obey the rules, even if she doesn't like them. Though Tarabadi eventually cut her hair, she swore to herself that she would do all she could to stop families from forcing young girls into convents against their will, as it happened to her. While in the convent, Archangela learned to read and write in Latin by continually scouring the Bible. Tarabadi found that the Bible did not support women's subordination, and to the contrary, the Bible actually argued for equality among the sexes. Thanks to outside collaborators like her brother-in-law, she was lent books from the outside world, 
helping her keep pace with intellectuals of her day, despite her isolation. Openly disobeying the rules in the convent, Tarabody wrote letters to writers, political figures, and scientists across Italy. Between the 23-year span of 1620 to 1643, very little happens in Tarabody's isolated life. But as the years wore on, a combination of factors made it possible for Tarabody to share her message with the world. The city-state of Venice had always a tense relationship with the institution of the Catholic Church in Rome. By 1605, the Pope was pushing for greater papal power, while Venice resisted any encroachment on its independence. As the situation escalated, both churchmen and Venetians published propaganda to appeal to European nations for support. In this environment, Venetian printers were able to publish all kinds of clandestine and polemical pieces against the church, thanks to a newfound atmosphere of freedom of the press. During this political struggle, Tarabody was introduced to the Academy Delgilio Incognitae, or in English, the Academy of the Unknowns, a group of intellectual noblemen with anti-papal leanings. Through her association with the Academy, Tarabody attained financial support and a web of contacts to help publish her work. Impressively, her work was supported by the head of the Academy, Giovanni Francesco Loredan. Tarabody's first published work was called Convent Life as Paradise, and it was published in 1643. 23 years after she had joined the convent. Here, Tarabody praises those who enter the convent due to religious calling, while condemning forcing girls with no religious aspirations to join their ranks. While this work lacked radicalism, it established Tarabody as a writer. Tarabody's next project was an anonymously published work called Anti-Satire, released in 1644. Anti-Satire responded to Francesco Bugassini of Siena, who wrote a tract against women's luxury, a Manipian satire. Here, Francesco ridiculed women for their apparent excessive love of clothes, hairstyles, and trinkets. Tarabody replied by applying Francesco's standards equally both to men and women, arguing that men, just like women, had an excessive love of expensive fashion. Fancy lace collars, padded stockings, and wigs. Both sexes indulge in an excessive love of fashion. Tarabody argued that women are excluded from education and are artificially made ignorant. For Tarabody, this lack of education is the root of why women are oppressed by men, because without a sufficient education, Tarabody said women do not know how to defend themselves, nor do they want to. Tarabody's final work published in her lifetime came in 1651, and was given the very, very lengthy title of Women Do Belong to the Species of Mankind, a Defense of Women. Writing under the pseudonym Gallerena Baraccati, Tarabody attempts to refute the arguments in Italian translation of a tract called Women do not belong to the species, mankind, an amusing speech. This track made the argument through scripture to prove that women lack a rational soul, meaning they cannot make moral decisions and thus cannot attain salvation in the next life. A disgusted and perturbed Tarabody dissects the track's argument with an exacting vigilance, showing how the author is selectively quoting scripture and relying on the reader's ignorance, not their intelligence. Tarabody's personal letters show us that she was doggedly determined to publish her works, Despite the numerous obstacles in the way of women publishing at the time, intellectual discussions were thought to only be for men. Despite her miserable life, Tarabody's writings gave her suffering a purpose. She would later write to her best friend that her writings are the most precious thing she had. But Tarabody always viewed one of her earliest works called Paternal Tyranny as her magnum opus. Though this work was not published during her life, the manuscript was copied and circulated amongst radical intellectual circles. Tarabody received feedback from many contacts and tweaked paternal tyranny to respond to readers' criticisms over the years. It was kind of like a long work in progress. Paternal tyranny is Tarabody's most extensive and impressive attacks on the trifecta of the state, church, and patriarchy, all of which conspire together to keep women under the thumb of men. The central message of paternal tyranny is a tirade against forcing women into religious orders against their will and the oppressions of patriarchy. But Tarabody also discusses the psychological torment of girls, a feminist rereading of the Bible, and an assertion of women's inalienable rights to equality, liberty, and education. Tarabody was well aware of the criticisms usually leveled at any female writer who complained of women's oppression. They were generally accused of relying on the reader's susceptibility to pity. They did not make forceful arguments, but instead merely manipulated men through their emotional language. Tarabody decided she wouldn't rely on pity. She avoids discussing her personal life in much detail, and instead opts for a much more aloof tone, despite the deeply personal connection to the topic at hand. Tarabody understands that to have any real effect on the practice of monetization, 
She had to focus her attack not on poorly acting individuals, but the system as a whole. Though, like feminists today, Tara Body's attacks on male behaviour do not qualify as sexism or man-hate. Because, as Tara Body explained, I condemn men's vices, not man himself. Tara Body did not hate men. She hated the system that they upheld, a point many feminists throughout history have been forced to stress. The title of paternal tyranny is not just for show either. It forms the core of her argument that the current relationship between men and women resemble a tyrant lording over a slave, with men being the tyrants and women being the slaves. Contemporary Venetians took great pride in the absence of tyranny in their political system. But Tarabody explains that each man who forces his daughter into a convent acts like a tyrant. They selfishly pursue their own interests by forcing their daughter away. They secure their luxuries at the expense of their daughter's freedom. Because of their enormous and unchecked power over women, men's desires become excessive and destructive. Lastly, men are tyrants because they thwart women's free will. Despite Venice's reputation for liberty, Tower Body shows the reader that Venice is home to many petty tyrants, prey on their own families of all people. Tower Body believes that the sexist current inequality is not natural. It has been established through generations of restrictive customs and traditions that force women into a position of subordination. Tower Body argues that the Bible expresses that women, like men, receive from God the gift of free will to decide how to live their lives. Tower Body writes that divine providence created both Adam and Eve is state of innocence with choice and free will. Tower Body refers to free will as a matchless gift. Thus, when men send their daughters to convents, they not only ruin their daughters' lives, but attack the foundations of their humanity, their free will. Tower Body writes of men who send their children into convents, what an unforgivable error, what a wicked decision, what a sheer audacity is this deed when divine providence, after all, has granted free will to his creatures, whether male or female and bestowed on both sexes intellect, memory, and will. According to Tower Body's rereading of the Bible, God intended that man and woman should be a partnership of equals. Tower Body affirms this, writing that God did not wish anything from them without their common consent. During the Renaissance, many writers believed in male superiority. Many countered this by matching their opponents' extremism, by arguing women were superior to men to match their intense misogyny. Somehow that would help. With both sides taking up either end of an extreme spectrum of male or female supremacy, Tower Body stands out for arguing for equality. Tower Body was unique because she argued both male and female were born free, bearing with them, like a precious gift from God, the priceless bounty of free choice. But if women had an inalienable right to liberty and were equal to men according to the Bible, how did their present situation where women were anything else but equal arise. Tower Body answers that men have secured their position by stunting the intellectual growth of women. Tower Body explains that men are to blame because they fear women becoming their equals. They do all in their power to stop women from educating themselves. So much so that Tower Body writes, as soon as you men catch sight of a woman with a pen in her hand, you start ranting and raving. And this is quite true. By making women ignorant, men can claim a false superiority over them. Tower Body argues women's intellect is not stunted through lack of native intelligence, but lack of schooling. Men say education would cause women to lose their chastity, and thus they have to stay ignorant for their own good. What a convenient system, Tower Body says. By denying women the opportunity of education, Tower Body argued that men seduce the whole world into believing women must be excluded from ruling. And yes, unlike her predecessors who mostly articulated women's moral equality, Tower Body went one step further arguing women should rule alongside men. Tower Body thought that God did not tell Adam he would rule over women. Instead, both men and women are naturally free. They each have from God the same thing, free choice. Tower Body never lived to see her magnum opus published. Paternal Tyranny was not an easy book to publish, after all. It attacked the church, the state, and traditional values. As the years wore on, Tower Body's bitterness towards her life, long imprisonment, did not really fade. She wrote that her life in the convent was a hell where no hope of exiting can enter. Eventually, Tower Body died on February 28th in 1652, at the age of 48. Her death was probably caused by tuberculosis in the end. Though she had made numerous attempts during her life to publish Paternal Tyranny, it was only after her death it was published in 1654 under a pseudonym. By 1660, the church authorities' attention turned towards paternal tyranny. 
By 1660, paternal tyranny was placed under the index of prohibited books by the Catholic Church for its tax upon the Church's reputation. Following her death, Archangela Tarbody became an obscure name, only cropping up occasionally in later collections. But by the 20th century, Tarbody began to resurface amongst academics who were impressed by her peculiar story and forward-thinking demands for equality amongst the sexes. Archangela Tarabody should be a figure of libertarians' respect. Understanding she was already doomed to life inside the convent walls until she died, Tarabody dedicated herself to defending women's status as rational beings endowed with free will, which gave them the right to determine how they should live. Tarabody in Paternal Tyranny is one of the first thinkers to argue that the unequal relationship between men and women is actually a form of political injustice, a form of tyranny. In Tarabody's day, it was understood that men had absolute authority over women. Some will act kindly towards their female subjects, while others will be selfish. But Tarabody was not saying that men in power lack kindness and ought to stop being selfish. She argued that any infringement on a woman's liberty was a moral crime, whether it was by some sort of selfish patriarch or a well-meaning person. Tarabody believed there was a moral duty to resist women's subjection, which is arbitrary and illegitimate, just like tyranny. The proto-feminist writings of Archangela Tarabody set the foundations for later feminists to affirm the rights and liberty of all women across the globe. For this, I think she deserves an honourable mention as a champion of women's rights, and the most defiant nun who ever criticised the church, the state, and the patriarchy, all at once. Thanks a mil for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Portraits of Liberty is written and hosted by me, Paul Meany, and produced by Landry Ayers. You can also visit libertarianism.org to find more shows like this. I hope to see you next time.